Hello, good evening everyone and a warm welcome to BIC Streams. Today's session is titled Kapila Vatsyayan 1928-2020, Opening Up Worlds. For today's conversation, we have with us Sudha Gopalakrishnan, Executive Director of Sahapedia, and Ambassador Sham Saran, the former Foreign Secretary, Government of India. The full bios of the speakers will appear in the chat box, uh, which, will, which is uh, at the bottom of your screens. If you have any questions, please post them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen next to the chat box. Do follow us on our social media handles on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And do not forget to sign up for our mailing list on our website. With that, I hand it over to Ambassador Saran. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and I'm very uh, grateful to uh, BIC for uh, giving me an opportunity to talk about my association with uh, Kapila Vatsayan, uh, who recently passed away. Uh, I had a very long association with her, almost uh, for 40 years uh, during my uh, diplomatic uh, career. And uh, of course, in the last few years, uh, we were fellow life trustees uh, with the India International Center uh, as well. And I got to know her uh, somewhat more closely than in the past. Uh, one, of the, one of the very important um, aspects of uh, Kapilaji's uh, you know, long career in the field of art and culture uh, was her uh, recognition that uh, in a country like India, where it had been through a period of uh, extended uh, colonial, colonization, uh, you know, the, the promotion of art and culture uh, was uh, something that, uh, whether we like it or not, uh, the uh, state had to play a role. Uh, and I think her effort was always to try and see that uh, even if the resources of the state uh, have to be, in fact, uh, gathered together uh, for the promotion of art and culture. Uh, that should be done in a manner that, you know, recognizes the intrinsic plurality of uh, Indian culture, which uh, gives, uh, in a sense, a platform to many forms of uh, Indian art uh, that perhaps the people of India are not, not even aware of don't even uh, know how to uh, appreciate. Um, there is a certain uh, classical form of Indian, uh, Indian culture and art uh, that perhaps we are more uh, aware of. Uh, but the, you know, the myriad forms of culture that uh, in fact uh, flourish in uh, all corners of uh, India. Uh, I think one of the very important objectives was uh, how do we bring that, uh, you know, uh, to the uh, surface that uh, all Indians could uh, actually appreciate and in a sense, uh, you know, value uh, the, this, this very rich uh, legacy that we uh, possess. So in that uh, context, you know, the role that she played uh, in, for example, setting up the Indira Gandhi National Center for uh, Performing Arts, uh, the um, National Gallery of uh, Modern Art, uh, she recognized the very important uh, contribution of uh, Tibetan culture uh, to India, uh, in many ways recognizing that uh, many parts of uh, India's intellectual tradition, particularly the Buddhist tradition, which was lost in India, uh, was lovingly preserved uh, in Tibet, in the monasteries uh, around uh, the vast expanse of uh, Tibet. And that uh, in order to understand our own culture, perhaps it is worthwhile to uh, you know, also study that uh, culture. And therefore, uh, the Institute for uh, Tibetan Studies in uh, Sarnath, which has become a very important center uh, for, uh, you know, uh, Tibetan uh, studies. Uh, the uh, India International Center itself, uh, perhaps one should <laughs> recognize that she was associated with uh, the uh, de development of the India International Center as some kind of a oasis of uh, intellectualism, of uh, you know, cultural excellence. Uh, she was very much uh, the person who uh, gave that kind of a reputation uh, to this institution. Uh, and even during the last decade of her life, uh, I don't know how many people are aware that she was heading this uh, uh, Asia research project. 
and uh, under the rubric of that uh, project, uh, one of our very important, uh, you know, aims was to try and see the connections uh, between uh, India's culture and the cultures of Southeast Asia, of uh, East Asia, Chinese, Japanese, uh, as well as uh, to the West uh, with uh, with uh, Iran, the the whole uh, connection with uh, Persia, and then she went on to Central Asia. Uh, so, you know, looking at India's, uh, shall I say, extended neighborhood to the east, to the west, to the north, and see how, you know, uh, not only the, the sense that many people have, oh, that India was the center from which culture flowed, you know, to all these peripheries, uh, not realizing that so much of India's culture actually was, in a sense, fertilized, in a sense, you know, enriched by all these encounters that we had uh, with different cultures uh, around, around uh, in this uh, region. Uh, you know, that, that uh, sense of humility that one should have in looking at these cultures. Uh, at least in my uh, interactions with her, uh, this was something that uh, she always used to uh, come up with, that, you know, one of the <laughs> force that Indian scholars have, that when they go abroad to places like Indonesia or Malaysia, they are constantly telling people there, oh, this you got from us. Uh, and that is something that uh, she was always, uh, sometimes even quite angry about, that. Uh, uh, what a crass way of, you know, uh, showing pride uh, in our uh, culture. So this is something which uh, uh, to me as a practitioner uh, was certainly uh, something, uh, something that I uh, appreciated. Um, if you look at uh, the post-independence period, I mean, she was part of a, of a, a, a Trimurti, I, <laughs> I would say. Uh, with, um, you know, Popul Jaikar, you had uh, Kamla Devi Chattopadhyaya, and I think uh, Kapila Vatsayan certainly uh, belongs to that particular very, very uh, distinguished uh, group. And all three uh, played a very, very seminal role uh, in not only the promotion of uh, various forms of Indian culture, uh, but also, as I said, in setting up the various institutions, uh, which... Uh, you know, were, were very much uh, uh, involved in uh, not only preservation, but also exploration. You know, I think that is uh, a very important aspect. And she herself contributed so much to that. You know, she was a, a scholar of uh, great rigor, uh, almost encyclopedic in her, in her, in, in the scope of her, of her work, uh, whether it was, uh, you know, Natya Shastra or looking at, you know, uh, sacred landscapes and how they impact on our attitudes, uh, looking at the uh, almost seamless connection between uh, folk as well as classical, not to look at them in separate boxes. Uh, many of these aspects, I think, were very valuable contributions uh, that she made. Uh, so I certainly uh, would, uh, would uh, miss her. And uh, she was like a Renaissance uh, person in a in a in the true sense, and um, you know much of her uh, legacy still survives in the form of almost ten, I think, twenty books that she has written on different aspects of Indian culture, of Indian art, or Indian dance, and I think they will always remain very valuable uh, reference points uh, whenever we want to see. Uh, the, the the various uh, dimensions of our cultural uh, heritage. Uh, thank you very much. So, if I may say a few words about him, and thank you first of all to the Bangalore International Center for inviting me to speak about Dr. Kapila Vasyayan, and I think I deem it a great honor to be talking about her, the scholar, thinker, arts administrator. She passed away recently, but, uh, 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 and also it marks, like Ambassador Saran said, the end of an era, perhaps, you know, it is, uh, so that's very, absolutely true. And after her demise, many people also spoke about her friends, admirers across the world. I mean, she had friends and admirers and colleagues across the world in that sense. So they also shared their personal memories, her contribution to the world, world of arts and culture, and I don't know how much needs to be said now anew, but I think I will also like all of them start with my own personal memories of 
how I, I met her uh, and then begin from there perhaps. Uh, so I saw her for the first time around the late 70s when I was a, a master's student in Kerala, in Kerala University. And she was giving a lecture based on her book on the square and circle of Indian arts in, the, in Kerala University. It was a very powerful presentation and she was doing uh, uh, with her gestures and some movements and, and it left a very deep impression mark in me. Then of course I was introduced to her in the late 80s when I was working in Delhi and then after I joined IGNC I got to know her work more closely and it was always was very impressed by that. That was the time when IGNC was in its heydays I would say teeming with activities. There the were many, many multiple programs running from rock art to textual studies to exhibitions and conferences and everything was going in such, such a dizzying pace and speed and you know, and though she was a great dancer and scholar herself on dance, she used to say that IGNC is not a performance venue unless it is connected to arts uh, uh, in, a, in a holistic sense, interdisciplinary sense. It is not. Uh, it is not just. Uh, you know. It is not a dance venue. Something like that. She was quite clear about that. It was not a single discipline, but it was a kind of holistic uh, thing. So it was, in a way, take, talking about all this. I think it's a very heavy responsibility. All those who knew her knew that she was a complex personality with a eclectic imagination, interest spanning several fields and diverse scholarship as Ambassador Seren just pointed out. The, uh, the beginning with her basic explorations in Indian dance, classical Indian dance and literature, her interest also covers sculpture, architecture, painting, crafts, textiles, Vedic studies, and quite I mean, a very large range in that sense. This intellectual background coupled with her dual responsibilities that she took up as a scholar, practitioner, and also as an administrator, gave her, I think, an edge and an opportunity and a perhaps a unique ability to look at Indian culture and arts from an interdisciplinary perspective. That, that I think that was her main, main uh, uh, contribution in one sense to Indian. She, again, she was associated with different national and international bodies and institutions. She helped set up several knowledge-based art-oriented institutions in different parts of India. She represented India in international forums, festivals, and also was part of committees on aspects relating to culture, education, arts. But I'd like to talk about her scholarship on Indian dance to say, so to say, like, again, but like you said, she, she had great knowledge of not just Indian, but also the dances of Southeast Asia, and other parts of the world in one sense. And she also was an expert on Gita Govinda, Natya Shastra, painting, sculpture. So in this broad concept, it'll be good to look at some of the things that she, she represented that struck me in her, in her career to the best that I'm aware of. In all her writings, I'd like to say here that discussions, projects, and setting up institutions, I think Kapilaji was trying to explore to look at look through an Indian window which she used to emphasize all the time an Indian window to the world outside in this Indian worldview there is a deep connection between nature and the human being and art of course to her to her art was not dissociated from life but something that happens as a response to life in one sense uh, in India uh, uh, also, it was also a product of the society that produces it. Uh, in this uh, response, we to dance performance, the weaving of a basket, a wall painting, a piece of sculpture, all are expressions of individual experience, though through a shared worldview, which is essentially Indian. This is an expression of life, and they are, she has said somewhere, like the petals of a flower that are strung, put together, but they represent the different aspects but also they are together in that sense. Her friend Bettina Baumer also has put it as a new approach that she took. A recontextualization is the word that she used. A recontextualization, this conceptual unity and interrelatedness of the arts 
between themselves and also to different other aspects of life in general. Well, I, I, having said about India, India, I don't think she had a close view of Western culture at all. Having studied in the US and having studied English literature for her masters, she was exposed to Western philosophy, literatures, and also to the, especially the dance and uh, aesthetic theories of the West. She also was uh, fascinated by the kinetic theories of Laban, La Mary, Martha Graham, the Russian ballet, and also appreciated the best of Western culture. But I think these reinforced her own calling towards India, where she saw an integral unity of thought, expression, and experience beyond differences. I think she remember, I remember call, calling that concept as in bold, I would say integrality. And, and it is not perhaps surprising that a volume on in her honor was dedicated, was called Art, the Integral Vision. So coming to her dance, uh, the, her, uh, her con connections to the theory of dance through a deep study of texts like the Nati Shastra, I think many of us know that she was intensively trained in Kathak and Bharatanatyam with stalwarts like Guru Achin Maharaj and Bala Saraswati, but also had training in other forms of dance, uh, like with deep interactions with Guru Kalamandalam Rao and Putinaya, for example, and friends like Shantar Rao, many people. She saw dance in India as a connected tradition. Again, as a connected tradition, there was no uh, and also was daring in one sense to break barriers of distinct styles and also between styles, for example, uh, uh, between folk and classical and between what the she uh, but she was not for dichotomies. She always thought that binaries were futile. There is no binaries in India. Everything is one, one organic whole. So in that sense, um, uh, the, the geometric body movements between Bharatanatyam and the flowing Mohiniyatam between Manipur's ex exquisite arts and the grand Kathakali, all these she studied so much and then because her books also show classical dance of India, folk dances of India. So also that she found deep connections between sculptural and architectural traditions of dance. Trained by scholars like Vasudeva Sharan Agarwala, the, the great scholar uh, who was her mentor and her I think PhD supervisor, Though she was trained, but she did one thing about her, I don't think, as she puts in her own, I think, reminiscences somewhere, she didn't entirely conform to those ideas also. The departure she made in studying sculpture was because of her training in dance, dance postures and stances. In those days, while scholars assessed a piece of sculpture on the basis of history, subject matter, or ornaments, and all that, she could analyze stance, position, feet position, contact with the ground, and other compositional details of her sculpture. And so that observations perhaps became the basis of her book on classical Indian dance, literature, and the arts. And the, coming to the other book, The Square and Circle of Indian Arts, she took again her observations much to a much deeper level and showed how geometric designs influenced Indian art, connecting them to sculpture, architecture, dance, music, and also to the com complex symbolism of the Vedic altar for one. So all these observations, I think that she gathered during her lifetime, crystallized into the study of Gita Govinda, that 12th century Sanskrit lyrical dramatic work of Jayadeva, which has had actually, as everyone knows, a tremendous influence in India on in music, dance, and other arts, and also has been translated, transcreated, has, has reinterpretations, commentaries in different regions, communities across India. So in a way, it, it has also influenced different dances, literatures, paintings, sculpture. In a way, it is a, that way a living text. Even now, it is a living text, I would like to say. So perhaps it's no wonder that Kapilaji adopted this poem for a grand digital multimedia project at IGMCA in collaboration with the Xerox Park USA creating an electronic database of multilingual texts, audio video recordings, manuscripts, talks and performances, rituals and recitations. Actually, I would like to say that in a way, this is a futuristic project uh, linking culture and technology for better access and assimilation. 
Though now it has become much more common in two or three decades back, you know, it was a very, very novel idea and it, uh, in that sense, I would like to say futuristic. Now coming to the book on Natya Shastra, Bharata the Natya Shastra, uh, uh, it is part of the series of Sahitya Academy called the Makers of Indian Literature. Uh, looking at the second century text, not in terms only content, te text and authorship, but also on the social context and its precursors of what happened earlier. It's a, though it's not a very big book, I think it is a very vital text for study for many years to come, is what I would I'd like to say. She notes, for example, the assertion that Natya Shastra is, though it is stated as a fifth Veda, it also says that this would be accessible to everyone, irrespective of caste, class, hierarchies, to that extent. And also it is in a way a radical, even revolutionary text, as she says. So in the book, there is an elaborate discussion on the nature of art experience, the sources, causes, vidhi, prayoga, shastra aspects. In, a, in, a, in short, it's a commentary in itself on the Natya Shastra and on Bharata's contribution. A close reading and analysis of these details, uh, 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 actually categorizations and distilled insights in the Natya Shastra reveals her for the scholar that she was on this, on this grand subject. So, um, uh, with these experiences, I think expertise, political advantage in one sense, and administrative experience, she was able to move the establishment of several institutions, such as what Ambassador Saran mentioned, the Central Institute of Higher Tibetan Studies, which I think she valued as one of her big contributions. She herself thought of it like that. Then Sarnath and the Nehru Memorial Museum and Library, the Center for Cultural Resource and Training, and also associated with a multitude of institutions in the field of art, culture, and education. If perhaps if the whole thing is a part of an Ehruvian vision, that institutions were the answer to the patronage of the arts. I mean, at that time, maybe she was a product of her times when she built these great institutions. Now, and as we now, now know that these institutions, as of the, four, the three academies, the state counterparts, the National Museum, the Archaeological Survey, National Archives, and many others during that time have actually um, were set up during this time. And from these varied experiences, Kapilaji may have developed this holistic understanding of Indian culture and the arts. She was, like I said, she was strongly against categorizations and dichotomies between textual, oral, theory and practice, Shastra, Prayoga, she always used to say, categorizations such as folk, classical, high, low, because these to her offered a kind of fragmented view of reality. So this integral understanding of culture, she took to bigger heights in setting up this Indira Gandhi National Center for the Arts in a manner of speaking was perhaps the realization of her dream. I'd like to say a few words about IGNC in this context uh, because I was working there in its early days. The institution was based on the premise that knowledge is integral and it is multidisciplinary. With this in view, the five intersecting divisions called Kala Kosha for textual studies, Janapada Sampada for contextual explorations, Kala Darshana for exhibitions and outreach, Kala Nidhi housing archives, library, reprography, and of course an administrative division called Sutradhara, were all crystallized into the grand design of IGNCA. During this time, many projects happened simultaneously, and of course, multidisciplinary conferences and grand themes such as time, space, nature and human, mask, and many others. In these thematic multimedia events, philosophers, archaeologists, art historians, artists came together to discuss these ideas and present their perspective and interacted with each other for a holistic, integral understanding of these ideas. And another thing she was very keenly aware of was the importance of archiving. The cultural archives of IGNCA, databases of manuscripts, paintings, and textual knowledge in microfilms and microfish, and artifacts and personal collections of great artists were all part of this uh, archive, cultural archives. Again, like I said, having said all this, I still like to believe that Kapilaji, like any other human being, was a product of her own times. She was exposed to the best of Nehruvian legacy of setting up institutions 
and has written a paper for UNESCO on some aspects of cultural policies in India for UNESCO in 1972. With a clear idea, I'm quoting her, culture was not the privilege of a small elite close to political power. This is what she writes in 1972. And that it resides as much through diverse communities, irrespective of religion, as much as through royal and official patronage. Actually, actually, it's a whole essay is very interesting. And today, whoever has an interest in cultural policy and politics of culture, during the, the, these times, it will be a very good read. I'd like to highly recommend that. But perhaps looking back, if I may, establishing these grand institutions by the government as guardians and patrons of culture may not have been a successful strategy. Now we are looking back at it. I mean, I'd like Ambassador, Ambassador Saran to respond to this one, this particular one. I wonder what Kapilaji herself may have had to say as we have seen many of these institutions now, which are unable to fulfill the mammoth responsibility and floundering perhaps also in one way, struggling under their own heavy weight of bureaucracy. I mean, I don't, I'm not saying this about one institution across, across the board in many, in, and as a common, common um, practice. In this context, IGNCA during her time and later has also been criticized as a product of a monopolizing idea, resisting contestation and dissent. An argu an another argument that, is, uh, that, that was often see, uh, uh, put forth is that it is a philosophic disagreement with the idea of integral vision itself may not have been, uh, uh, was one of the, uh, perhaps everything is not so connected, you know, there's also the understanding Perhaps difference, which she recognized, of course, is as much a key to understanding culture as unity. Unity is wonderful, but difference, we, they say we long live difference. You know, is through difference also as much as unity. I mean, of course, she was very well aware of that. But yeah, but the, so that's another thing I'd like to ask Ambassador Saran. Then the other aspect is about access and dissemination. How much of this vast knowledge that has been accrued, that has been put together, that has been reaches the popular imagination or even those who seek access to it. Uh, uh, this has been another problem that has been, uh, you know, uh, I, mean, I have been asking myself about, about these, I mean, uh, the, these great efforts, wonderful efforts. And these are, large, these are large questions she may have addressed, I think, if she had a longer, I mean, I would like to say a longer run and a longer, because life, as we knew, has been changing so much. The power of digital technologies, social media. I mean, she was aware of these things, perhaps these issues, but now they have become so crucial to our lives and how she would have tackled with these things in is also during this pandemic times. I mean, these are, or, you know, these are, I think now as crucial to culture, the culture sector as, I mean, as, I mean, as any other. So these are some of the problems and at the same time, I mean, I'd like to ask Ambassador Saran about some of these questions. Thank you so much. Yeah. So thank you very much. Uh, relevant observations that you have made. Um, you know, you raised the issue of uh, institutions and uh, how they seem to have uh, failed uh, in terms of uh, perhaps what they should have been uh, doing. Uh, but uh, let me uh, say that, um, you know, uh, institutions uh, are uh, important, uh, they are indispensable. Uh, it's a question of whether uh, they are, uh, you know, sufficient. And I think here uh, institutions by themselves uh, cannot deliver unless there is also a, a, uh, the human element, you know, the leadership element uh, in those institutions. Uh, therefore, I think we have to uh, keep in mind that uh, these institutions, at least in their original intent, as far as I could understand, uh, the original intent was to have these institutions as enablers, uh, not necessarily as active participants, but actually providing a platform which could enable, uh, you know, cultural interaction, cultural uh, dialogue, intellectual interaction, um, they were also say, uh, uh, seen as, uh, uh, as I said, as uh, platforms on which 
uh, a, a lot of the uh, you know interaction could take place. Uh, if we are saying, well, oh, maybe they did not really do what they were supposed to, uh, let me ask the question: What would the cultural scene in India be like if none of these institutions had been set up? You know, I, I think uh, <laughs> if I uh, consider that question, I would say that there would be a big void. Uh, had these institutions not been in place. So yes, they have their limitations. Yes, perhaps they have not evolved in the manner that we may have wished. But uh, I think we should also recognize uh, their importance in terms of being those enablers, in terms of being those uh, platforms. Uh, if there is, a, there is a gap, it is in terms of, you know, what kind of leadership uh, do we have? Uh, in these institutions. And I think that is where perhaps some of the failings, some of the frustration that we have uh, maybe uh, relates to that. I don't think it is with respect to the uh, institution itself. The yeah. second aspect uh, that you spoke about, you know, uh, the uh, looking at uh, unity, you know, uh, looking at uh, interconnections, uh, looking at, you know, some kind of universality as far as uh, Indian art and culture is uh, concerned. Uh, here again, I would like to make a distinction. One is, you know, through uh, the, these intellectual explorations, through the studies that uh, she carried out, uh, people like you who have done so much of work in terms of, for example, uh, the textual uh, heritage of, uh, of uh, Indian uh, culture. Uh, you know, uh, the, the, the scholar who undertakes this, may do through a certain prism, through a certain frame. I grant that. But you know, when you have brought that out, uh, you know, and presented it, what does it do? It provides a frame of reference for many other, you know, perspectives, many other, uh, you know, uh, sort of uh, 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 an analysis which may <laughs> lead to very different uh, conclusions. But you know, that does not detract from the value of this tremendous work that has been done, like what you mentioned about, say, uh, the Natya Shastra or uh, some of the work uh, that uh, she has uh, done in looking at those interconnections that you uh, spoke about. Now, uh, some people may disagree. Is there really a flow as the, she felt uh, from the folk traditions to the classical tradition? Or you should not you know, force them <laughs> to be in the same category. They are actually parallel, you know, trends. Uh, they do not necessarily have, have a connection. Uh, or that to try and see those affinities is limiting them. Uh, I think this is a point of view. Uh, I do not think that necessarily, I would uh, certainly not uh, to subscribe uh, to that. But I think what should be recognized that the tremendous body of work that she herself produced and she enabled, in fact, uh, you see, are, are, that can be used for uh, by many other scholars uh, forward in whatever manner they uh, wish to. Uh, I think uh, what has to be recognized is that she did not say it is only my perspective <laughs> which is valid and no other perspective is is to be uh, is to be uh, you know uh, admitted i think that that is something and lastly i would like to uh, point out uh, looking at the interdisciplinary aspect that you talked about which i think is very very important irrespective of what your ideological uh, perspective may be uh, you know when she uh, i think i forget uh, what prize it was that she got and she, in the acceptance speech, uh, she referred to the story from the Purans of uh, King Vajra and uh, the sage Markandeya. Yes. And, uh, you know, uh, Vajra says to Markandeya, can you please teach me uh, iconography uh, yes. so that I can learn how to make, you know, the best uh, images of the various deities so that I can worship them uh, in, the, in the best manner possible. And Markandeya tells him, well, it's not so easy. <laughs> First of all, you have to learn painting, uh, be a painter before you can become, become an iconographer. Uh, so he said, okay, will you please uh, teach, teach me painting? 
is that well you know a painting can be taught to you but you know in order to do painting you first also uh, need to learn about rhythm you need to learn about music you must need to learn how to play various instruments uh, only then can you really think in terms of uh, you know uh, this uh, the the dancing uh, so he says well treat me tre uh, treat, uh, uh, teach me these as well and he says no not only instrumental music because instrumental music uh, first of all you have to master vocal music before you can <laughs> master instrumental music yes. uh, and you know he goes on uh, so finally you end up by looking at a vast sort of uh, array of uh, of uh, disciplines that you must master uh, before you can really become somebody who's who's uh, who's a great uh, you know artist or uh, or or uh, understands uh, culture so i think this was something that uh, she felt uh, was was of great importance that looking at not only interconnections amongst different cultural traditions folk or classical but also to look at different disciplines and how they how they uh, come together and in that sense she felt that uh, the indian tradition because it so much emphasizes this aspect uh in terms of art and culture uh she felt this was a huge contribution to uh you know understanding of culture un in in a universal sense uh so i think uh, that uh, is what uh, i would like to in response to what you said uh, what i would like to say that is a very yeah, she always used to talk about that interconnection through the example that you she yeah. that quite a lot that was yeah this was a favorite <laughs> example i think <laughs> example and in a way her life represented that same same yeah. philosophy i think yeah, but coming yeah. back to some one more aspect which i'd like to raise with you which is a bit controversial perhaps but at the same time something that is vital because it has been raised in a pub in public for it uh, with, um, there has been a criticism about her that she represents a kind of sarkari a kind of sarkari culture and there is some uh, she uh, so would you like to respond to that <laughs> <laughs> well being being part of sarkar myself at some time <laughs> it is it is perhaps difficult to respond to this uh, question because uh, i am not quite sure what uh, is uh, sarkari in that uh, in that sense <laughs> uh but uh, let me let me uh, again uh, point out that this links up to what i said uh, earlier what is the role of the state right in in relation to culture Absolutely. okay uh and uh, many possibilities are there so for me what is the ideal in terms of that relationship uh, i said the relationship should, should be one of enabler uh rather than prescribing how you should say uh, project uh, the culture or is there a national culture uh, which has certain you know very very well defined boundaries uh, and only that is uh, permitted to be projected uh, yes that would be limiting but uh, i think the state can actually play a very positive and constructive role in making resources available setting up institutions which do become these enablers uh they become platforms where interactions become possible you know rather than saying you can only say this in when this interaction is taking place you can only say this uh let me say that this was probably true uh in the earlier years Uh, of uh, india's uh, independent existence uh, perhaps it has diminished uh, uh, where you know the the urge to <laughs> limit what uh, is understood by indian culture uh, is is becoming somewhat uh, a constraining uh, also factor also perhaps the right to dissent the right to say no the right to dissent is very important it only through dissent that something goes an argument or an idea goes ahead you know because contestation is as important so as so uh, those who may think that uh, you know there is no link between political and culture uh, are completely uh, you know sort of misunderstanding the the well, i mean in real life there is a connection whether we like it or not we may like to keep politics away from culture but uh, i'm afraid uh, they are in a sense uh, intertwined and you cannot unravel 
uh, that uh, relationship. Uh, so uh, what you say is is very very uh, important, I, and I think uh, the reason why there is a certain uh, kind of vitality uh, to India's culture and its artistic traditions to me is precisely because of that uh, of that uh, you know uh, the 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 tradition of uh, descent Turk and Vitark. Uh, you know, which is very, very, very important, uh, or, uh, or uh, you know, the argumentative Indian. Exactly. Uh, yes. You know, so I think uh, uh, that is uh, very much a part and parcel of uh, uh, this intellectual tradition as well as the uh, cultural tradition. And it would be a very sad day where, whether it, we are artists or whether we are scholars or we are ordinary citizens, uh, we feel constrained in terms of expressing what we really believe and what we really uh, feel. Uh, that is what is the greatest danger uh, to me as far as the uh, future of, uh, you know, the Indian cultural experience is concerned. Since I mentioned about one more thing, which, uh, uh, which I'd like to ask you one sec once more, uh, it's about access and dissemination. I mean, digital technologies has, has have transformed what we knowledge what we think as knowledge today. I mean, there is a I mean, of course uh, the, there's a kind of scope for many 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 people more to access to reinterpret to recast whatever we thought were actually bastions of you know. So in this kind of a context, what do you think the, the, somebody who has as visionary as Kapilaji? Uh, may have forged a new idiom, a new yeah. idea. In the, yeah. In the uh, so I think the whole point uh, of uh, what uh, she was trying to do in setting up institutions or to have, you know, various interactions, as I said, under the uh, Asia Research uh, Project uh, was precisely dissemination, you know. Uh, and of course, you know, we have to recognize that in India, uh, getting an audience for, you know, what we may consider, you know, uh, the cultural experience is not always very easy. Uh, so it is today, I think the challenge is not so much whether or not that, you know, whole body of cultural experience can be made available through digital sources like uh, your own, uh, you know, wonderful website of uh, Sahapedia is doing, uh, really making available uh, the richness of the uh, of of India's uh, culture and art uh, to whoever whoever which they wishes to access it. <laughs> there is no there is no uh, price attached to it. Uh, there is no uh, limitation in terms of uh, you know you must be a member or you must belong to a certain category. Uh, it is open to all. Uh, and uh, I, uh, I think the big challenge is uh, not so much that the material is not easily available, but how do we persuade people? Right. How do we inspire people to actually connect with this, this huge, rich heritage uh, that they are a legacy of, in a sense? Uh, you know? uh, and uh, in terms of the uh, technology aspect, uh, you know, in one of the tributes I gave to her, I mentioned the fact that, you know, in uh, India International Center, I did a whole series on uh, technology and the impact of technology on, on society uh, yeah. called metamorphosis. Uh, and it was looking at uh, different aspects of, of how the digital economy, for example, is beginning to uh, impact on even uh, art and uh, culture, on media, uh, on social interaction. And uh, on, for several of those, uh, <laughs> she came and sat through, uh, you know, those uh, interactions and uh, was uh, very, very curious about, uh, you know, what this technology is all about and how that can be brought into uh, the project that she was trying to, you know, uh, sort of uh, continue with. Uh, so uh, I think uh, technology today offers a, a huge, uh, you know, sort of instrument in order to do this uh, dissemination that we are talking about. But there still, to me, there still remains the issue of how do we excite people, how do we inspire people, 
uh, to actually uh, you know access this and here i think i would like to just get this into your education system here mathematics learning science but how do we also from a very young age uh, also instill this kind of you know uh, a, a, a appreciation uh, of uh, culture not the national culture that some people are complaining <laughs> complaining about but you know providing the mental uh, sort of uh, instruments uh, in order to make their own judgment about uh, art about uh, cultural issues because for that also you need a certain idiom you need to understand an idiom before you can get uh, to that point uh, so that is uh, something which is is as perhaps uh, uh, very important uh, maybe she may not have looked at how this is to be done right from the uh, word go but i think that to me seems to be a very critical component of what we should be doing thank you so much yeah, she was a advisor of uh, sahapedia also and we have presented to her and she has really appreciated this is a kind of futuristic um we have a few questions from the audience uh and uh, we will bring them on we will allow them to speak and switch on their mic so that they can ask their questions um may i have um, ambassador lata ready to ask a question please uh, can you hear me yes, yes we can hear you Yes. Okay, uh, my question was uh, that you know I had the opportunity to work with uh, Dr. Kapila Vatsyayan uh, when I was in ICCR, and uh, she, with immense patience, uh, guided me uh, very carefully on how to organize a seminar on the Sufi traditions, and also along with uh, with Saida Hamid, the well-known scholar. Uh, to bring out a book on on Sufi traditions at the same time. This was quite many a few years ago. It was in 1990, uh, and uh, but I found her a person of immense intellectual rigor. Uh, but to others, she sometimes perhaps came across as somewhat intimidating because of the very high standard that she set. Uh, would you think, Ambassador Saran, that uh, that would that would have been a barrier for some of the people to come to her with ideas? Oh, well, uh, the fact that she was intimidating because of her uh, scholarship and because of her, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, great uh, emphasis that, that she put on uh, excellence, uh, even perhaps bordering perfection. Uh, yes, uh, that she was very demanding. There is no uh, doubt in my mind uh, about it. Uh, but then, you know, uh, that was her personality. Uh, and I uh, do not think that if we had gone to her and said, you know, you need to be less <laughs> intimidating <laughs> uh, uh, in order to uh, have uh, perhaps uh, a greater, greater impact. Uh, I think she would have um, perhaps very angrily said, no, uh, you know, uh, I have, I have uh, certain uh, standards uh, and this must be, must be, uh, you know, observed. Uh, I found this uh, uh, and uh, Lata, you are also aware of uh, the um, festivals of India, which we did you know, right. in the ninth, yeah, 1980s and later. And uh, one thing which struck me about both uh, Kapila ji, who was also associated closely, I, I was the coordinator for the Festival of India in Japan. And uh, whether it was, uh, you know, a folk performance or whether it was a classical performance, uh, both Popul Jaikar uh, and Kapila ji uh, insisted always uh, that uh, quality must be, uh, you know, of the highest uh, order. Uh, so this is like, for example, if uh, dancers came with, uh, you know, costumes which were, had not been ironed properly, she would get very, <laughs> very upset, uh, you know, or if they didn't have uh, their, 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 their demeanor was, uh, you know, not quite uh, uh, that of a, of a, of a good artist, uh, she would uh, then uh, very patiently explain <laughs> how, how they should behave. So I think um, uh, I would say that that uh, was her personality, I, I acknowledge. Uh, 
but uh, then I don't think that even if you had tried to change that, you would get very far. That's but right, sir. <laughs> Sharon, if I may also say something about this aspect. Uh, actually, uh, you said about the pursuit of excellence. I mean, of course, she pursued excellence and it may not have been that easy for her to during her time when she grew up and she writes about also, I think, somewhere. I mean, how she had to be in a world in which, I mean, many, many things were gender. There is also a lot of gender issue. Yes. There. And she had to survive in a place where there is a lot of you know, resistance to a woman learning this and that. Absolutely. And going around. So that also must have, all that must have molded her personality. Without that, she may not even have reached where she reached. Yeah. 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 But I must say that in my own interactions uh, with her, uh, I actually found her a very gentle uh, person. Uh, you know, um, I maybe I was fortunate not to <laughs> not to be at the receiving end uh, of uh, that more uh, you know uh, demanding uh, side of her personality. Um, but you know, I, I think she was a complex person. I think you yourself said that she was a very complex uh, person, and uh, um, because of the experiences that she uh, shared, that she, and we should just learn to accept that. I think uh, beneath the veneer of all that toughness and all that, she was also a very gentle person, yes. loving person, and a caring, uh, caring for her, you know, colleagues and friends, and I think. If I could add to my question, uh, you know, I also found that she changed a lot when she was older. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, she became much more <laughs> mellow, much more accepting because I had opportunities to interact with her later on. Uh, yes. So I would agree with uh, Sudha Gopalakrishnan that uh, the early years of struggling, you know, and I've been through it also, you know, the, the gender issue. Uh, uh, do certainly uh, make you make you need to be tough in a certain sense to prove yourself. But once you have proven yourself and you're accepted, uh, I think it's easier to be more mellow and perhaps uh, more accepting of uh, faults in others, if I can put it that way. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Reddy, for that. Uh, next, we have uh, D.A. Prasanna. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes we can hear you. Okay. S sir, first of all, uh, I think uh, you, both of you having worked closely with uh, Dr. Kapila Vatsayan have given us a very good insight of the personality and uh, her contribution to the field of art and culture is highly appreciated. I would like to echo uh, Madam uh, Dr. Lata's uh, um, view that uh, a lot of people from outside Delhi, artists, institutions, were intimidated by what I would call the intellectual power, the closeness to the Nehru and senior bureaucrats, and a sort of centralization of culture and a centralization of access to funding, centralization of access to decision makers, where old institutions like Shantiniketan or JJ School of Arts or Baroda School of Art or artists from more remote parts from Delhi found it very difficult to break the fort created by Pupul Jaikar, Kapila Vatsayan and uh, Romila Thapar, Narayan Menon. I mean, I know the case of, uh, for example, Maya Rao, who was another very scholarly dancer you know, she felt suffocated and had to leave Delhi and establish herself in Bangalore. Similarly, Narayan Menon had imposed a rule that harmonium is not suitable for uh, All India Radio's uh, inside in chamber music or what they would record. So a lot of Indian artists, classical musicians could not play without harmonium. So while we greatly appreciate the contribution made by them, one feels that uh, had it been more uh, inclusive, had it been less intimidating, it would perhaps have been richer, the cultural contribution made by them. I would like your comments. Uh, Sudha, would you like to go first? 
Yeah, uh, well, I don't know whether intimidation is the word, uh, uh, Mr. Prasanna. You don't have to be intimidated if you don't, if you don't want to be intimidated. So having, having said that, um, I think, yeah, the, 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 like what, what uh, Ambassador Seren was saying and also, I mean, there's, there's, uh, there is a kind of state-sponsored culture and there's also like the diversity of our tradition. So it's a choice that one makes, I think, in what one has to do, irrespective of whether it's a one's own belief and one's own conviction that takes one ahead rather than some, some stricture that comes from above in that situation. But I don't think that is a big problem, uh, at least in my understanding. Yeah. Uh, let me just um, uh, add to that by uh, pointing out that, uh, you know, uh, take, take uh, the festivals of uh, India. Uh, which were, uh, in fact, uh, Popul Jaikar and uh, Kapilaji played a very important role in, uh, in orchestrating uh, those uh, festivals. But uh, uh, say in Japan, this was the first time that uh, many of the uh, folk traditions in music and dance uh, were actually brought to the international stage. Uh, and I may say through that also uh, were brought to the national stage. You know, it is when they were very much uh, You know, Tejan Bai, for example. Uh, you know, uh, many of the, or the, in, in Japan, for example, one of the most uh, um, successful exhibitions was that of Madhubani paintings. And, you know, bringing uh, artists from uh, Madhubani village uh, to actually demonstrate how they do these uh, these uh, paintings on on mud mud uh, huts, uh, so uh, not only uh, classical music, but this was actually the first time that a lot of the folk art, folk uh, music and culture uh, was given uh, a, a international international exposure, uh, and they have not looked back in that sense. So, uh, is this was this a good thing that the state did? In, in promoting promoting this, uh, it would not have been possible without uh, without the uh, support of the state. You know, we also had, for example, in Japan, you know, um, tribal art uh, exhibition uh, from the northeast as well as from from other parts uh, of uh, India. Um, and uh, so, uh, what could have been done more uh, in order to perhaps uh, you know. Uh, be more inclusive. Uh, there is always something more that you could have done. But uh, my uh, own view is uh, that um, what was done was at least uh, something which would not have happened if these people had not, in fact, made that uh, contribution. So I don't think that it is an either or uh, kind of a, a situation. Uh, they, they did uh, play an important role uh, in, uh, in uh, giving, giving uh, a greater uh, sort of exposure uh, to these very rich uh, traditions. And I think what uh, many of us, even, uh, like, as I said, I was uh, coordinator of the Festival of uh, uh, India in Japan. Uh, I, I am very happy to admit that several of these <laughs> you know, traditions uh, I may have vaguely known about, but I certainly did not appreciate how uh, rich uh, that 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 tradition in uh, India is. Uh, so, um, could we be more inclusive? Uh, of course, uh, but uh, we did not take that into account ever. No, I do not so, uh, agree with that. Um, next, we have uh, Sri Lakshmi Guru Raja. Uh, I just want to say that the conversation so far between uh, Sudha Gopal Krishnan and Ambassador has been extremely useful and in showing us what uh, Kapila's uh, range and depth of her uh, work and her life, basically. My, uh, I have two questions. One is how do we use this uh, tradition of Kapila, I mean, I'm not, uh, I don't want to get into the inclusive part of it, but uh, how do we, how are we disseminating? How do we take it forward?
to the common man and the common woman today because there is definitely that vacuum which has been filled in is being filled in by stuff which is not really what is our uh, if i may use the word ethos and uh, i think professor saran uh, ambassador saran said a little earlier this whole question of what is being pushed around as uh, promoted as our culture what is the kind of i'll use the word bias uh, that is coming in and how do we who is there to protect this do we have uh, i know that uh, i have met sudha in the bangalore international center i know that she is one of those who is trying to hold on uh, to the pure uh, tradition of our culture and everything else but right now who's there to protect uh, us meaning all of us from this kind of imposition that is happening and who is the next people jaiker or kamala devi or kapila watsain and sudha as well so that's something that sticks with me sometimes when i listen to such discussions that uh, how do we preserve and do we have uh, some kind of a mechanism for preserving this right now thank you uh, sudha yeah uh i uh, <laughs> please don't club my name with these people i i totally object to that secondly um uh, i think somebody protecting a few cultures is it a way to sustain any form the community the the practitioners themselves the people who own them have to be the main people who protect any culture without that if it is something from above as we have seen in many instances does not sustain anything but having said that you are absolutely right that patronage and 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 uh, you know uh, what normally what happens is that you know there is a kind of selection as a pastor saran said and then maybe the some people get selected and for all this recognition where some people do get left by the wayside these are actually very burning problems in the field of culture i totally understand that but basically i think it has to be a much more democratic way of safeguarding or or uh, like again uh, the uh, the government cannot be total pet they can be enablers they can how to facilitate that kind of a strategy it i think the i think is very important i think yeah uh so uh you know again here uh, uh, we face the dilemma of uh, you know what role do we want uh, the state to play yeah. because if we are talking about bias uh, there is no doubt that some of that bias is coming from the state in a manner perhaps that was not necessarily the case if they may have been some uh, influencing some interference but uh, i think we have moved from a phase where there was more of an enabler a sort of a, a, a attitude uh, rather than a influencer kind of an attitude uh, i think it is getting in a sense uh, reversed uh, but uh, what uh, you know is uh, to me perhaps the greatest safeguard in terms of the vitality of indian culture the vibrancy of uh, indian uh, culture is the sheer diversity of india i think it is impossible for even the most powerful state to try and put a monochromatic frame over this immense diversity and plurality so if i'm looking at a somewhat uh, longer uh, run perspective uh, if this is a project to homogenize uh, in some form uh, indian culture or to to project a kind of a singular identity and a narrow singular identity uh, of this culture uh, i certainly believe that uh, this will fail uh, because of the uh, as i said because of this immense uh, plurality uh, of this uh, country uh, there is so much happening in in every corner of india you know uh, sudha has been working for example in chatisgarh uh, looking at you know the uh, the cultural traditions uh, there both uh, looking at the conservation of the classical aspect but also looking at living culture there uh, and i think she would agree with me that uh, 
you know, no matter where you travel in India, uh, far away from what the <laughs> state may be doing or the state may be saying, um, you know, these things are sprouting, these things are, you know, flourishing uh, in a manner that it is almost impossible to control. And I think that is possibly also the reason. This is not, uh, let me say, this is not a, uh, a unique phase in Indian history. There have been also phases in Indian history where there has been attempt by uh, the state uh, precisely to do that kind of, uh, you know, homogenization. But it has never succeeded. Uh, it has not succeeded because precisely because of that uh, plurality. Uh, so um, how do we how do we ensure that uh, the this legacy of uh, a, you know appreciating plurality, this uh, ability to uh, yes, I would I certainly feel that there are affinities even in this diversity. But I say affinity. Uh, it is not a a, a kind of identity. Uh, a singular identity. I reject that. But affinities, I certainly feel. I mean, I'm not a scholar, so I, maybe I cannot uh, articulate it in scholarly terms, but purely as somebody who has been watching this uh, and, you know, engaged in, say, cultural uh, diplomacy, uh, I do feel that there are uh, affinities and those affinities are valuable. Uh, we should not try to put them in, 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 in you know, sort of boxes. But uh, recognizing those affinities is in no sense to me limiting those traditions. I do not uh, believe that. I don't think uh, Kapilaji believed that uh, either. Uh, that there was necessarily, you know, by, by looking at those affinities, you are somehow or the other, uh, you know, diminishing uh, those uh, traditions. No, I don't think so. But uh, that uh, diversity is something which is, which is to me, uh, a guarantee. Uh, that uh, this legacy in its way, most vibrant form is going to continue despite what we see as uh, the bias. And I think, uh, as uh, Sudha said, you know, a great deal depends upon the community. Uh, you cannot prescribe for people uh, what they should, uh, you know, value, what they should not value. It must come from inside. Uh, how can I tell somebody, oh, you must appreciate this? I cannot. Uh, you can orient people in a certain direction, but ultimately that decision is theirs. The agency is theirs, not mine or Kapilaji's <laughs> for that matter. Yeah. Uh, so I think this is a more uh, complex uh, question, but I would say whether we are as artists, whether we are as scholars, whether we as citizens who recognize the value of dissent, who recognize the value of you know, having a, a, a environment which encourages, you know, thinking, encourages, uh, you know, looking at uh, different uh, different aspects of uh, whatever we are, whatever we are considering. Uh, I think uh, this is what we need to do, even as citizens. Uh, so I very much appreciate, for example, somebody like uh, Tian Krishna, who, uh, uh, you know, is not only a great musician, but who has this also, this very strong sense uh, of, you know, uh, precisely, uh, you know, preserving that aspect of uh, Indian Indian culture. So, as artists, as citizens, as scholars, uh, despite this bias that we come up against uh, again and again, uh, we have a duty, uh, we have a responsibility to keep that alive. To add one more point to exactly what you said is absolutely correct. To add one more point to what you said, uh, one way of again survival is to is that people are reinterpreting their heritage, they are recasting their heritage in according to times, to the tune of times to be, uh, to, to, to put it literally, metaphorically perhaps when it comes to TM Krishna. Not just TM Krishna, even few communities, people are adapting in terms of their tools, their technologies, I and mean, people still listen to music, but then in a different way they adapt from a read, now it has become a PVC pipe, but still they do, they do read the, the, sing their songs, they, you know. So things are getting readapted according to time. So in a way, I don't think it is that drastic that we feel that everything is gone from us. No, no, uh, certainly hasn't <laughs> all gone. I hope not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. 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 Uh, 
We have a few questions that I will read out because due to technical reasons, they're not able to ask them themselves. Uh, Raj Nandini Shaw asks, did Dr. Vatsyayan think of expanding performing arts studies at the undergraduate level? Uh, well, I, uh, I'm, I'm not uh, aware of uh, whether, uh, because I also mentioned uh, the aspect of how uh, you know, uh, one of the important things that perhaps is missing is not having uh, this in the curriculum uh, of uh, even uh, our schools. Uh, so uh, I, 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 apart from the institutions that uh, she had uh, set up uh, for research and for uh, for uh, you know keeping keeping alive these uh, traditions. Uh, and also supporting uh, various uh, universities and colleges uh, in some of the work that they were doing. Uh, no, I am not aware of her actually working out some kind of a curriculum for undergraduate studies in in, in uh, art and culture. No, uh, maybe Sudha has has more uh, more uh, information about that. I don't think she uh, she was uh, keen about even transforming IGNC into a university because she, she thought that that kind of a system may not work, but no, but no, she has, I, to the extent of my knowledge goes, I don't think she yep. was. Next question is uh, from Rashmi Dhanwani. She has a two-parter with specific focus on uh, Dr. Vatsyana's writing around cultural culture policy, pointing to some aspects of cultural policies in India, uh, 1972, but other writings in general. How do you think it impacted the view of culture policy and building plus administering plus regulating the space in India? And there's a follow-up. Do you feel her own role as an administrator and a bureaucrat influenced a certain style of building, supporting, running, and growing cultural institutions at the time, be it government institutions or otherwise. Yeah, I, I think uh, Sudha, since you are aware of what uh, she said about cultural policy, uh, perhaps you could uh, you could go first. Yeah, she she was I think uh, uh, sensitive to linking it linking culture with education. She was also uh, I think interested in disseminating uh, culture in a wide way and also having all these programs running. That is exactly why these institutions from different domains, I mean, one is a national museum, one is a center for cultural resources and training, training teachers on cultural knowledge to be imparted to students. So it is not that she was not, she did have a very, very large, but this was in 1972. Uh, so, you know, now, of course, if she were to do so, uh, another cultural policy, I don't know how she would have done it. I have no idea, but this was done for UNESCO in 1972 in collaboration with UNESCO. But yeah, all these aspects, she was sensitive to, um, broadly sensitive, but, and, and in, through her work, I would like to say her reflected, her work reflected her passion and her understanding. Yeah. Uh, also, I would like to mention that, uh, you know, she was not uh, in, in, in a sense, uh, a, a sort of a, uh, uh, a, uh, a classical bureaucrat <laughs> like uh, some of us uh, have been uh, because she came from the cultural side uh, into bureaucracy. Um, so I think we should uh, recognize uh, that where, where she was coming from. She was not a bureaucrat to begin with. And uh, this is the reason why even as a bureaucrat, she was able to do a great deal uh, in the uh, cultural field. For the first time, you had somebody who not only had that uh, that knowledge uh, background uh, and that passion, as uh, Sudha says, uh, but uh, the, uh, the her position in the bureaucracy as a senior bureaucrat uh, gave her the uh, ability to bring uh, martial resources of the state uh, and also to put in place, uh, you know, the kind of policies that uh, uh, actually, uh, to my mind, uh, actually were very very. Uh, you know, uh, effective uh, during a certain period of time. I mean, the, the, you know, the, the situation environment has also been changing uh, a lot uh, 
since the time that she was in that position. And so uh, uh, was, uh, in fact, my sense is that her role as a bureaucrat coming from outside uh, enabled her to put into practice uh, some of the ideas uh, that uh, she had. But uh, she also, in some of the conversations that uh, I had with her, she also <laughs> expressed a lot of frustration uh, about her time as a, as a bureaucrat, that she was, uh, you know, in a sense, also being limited by rules and regulations and by, you know, uh, constant uh, reminder from from the uh, bureaucrats around her, by the finance people that you can't do this, you cannot do that. Uh, and which she managed to overcome, by the way, in many cases, by because of her access to political leadership. Uh, I think we have to re recognize that that she had a very easy uh, access to people like uh, Indra, Indra Gandhi, Rajiv Gandhi uh, thereafter. Uh, so uh, that gave her that gave her the ability to overcome some of those bureaucratic uh, hurdles in taking forward what she wanted to do. And, and she was very highly respected uh, by political leadership. Uh, enjoyed uh, tremendous credibility and, uh, and uh, uh, as I said, uh, respect there. So uh, the, her, her role as a, a bureaucrat was, to my mind, at the end of the day, not a limiting role at all. Uh, it enabled her, she was good at using those assets that she had in trying to uh, in fact, uh, put into practice many of the ideas that she had. And that was the uh, last question of the evening. Okay. Uh, thank you, Ms. Gopalakrishnan and Ambassador Saran for helping thank us you. remember this cultural icon and her life's work, locating it in, in, a, in such a wide context and giving us a glimpse of the spec of a spectrum of her personality. We are so glad to have partnered with the fantastic Sahapedia for this session. Thank you everyone who tuned in and engaged with the conversation. Good night and see you next time. Thank you. Thank you, so much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sudha. Thank you. Sir.